Today, traditional music is at the center of a thriving community of musicians young and old. This is in part due to the many revivals such music has enjoyed over recent years, without which the situation may have been very different. A hundred years ago, there was very few people playing Irish music. It was really on its knees, and even up until whenever I was a child, the only people that I heard playing traditional music uh, was our own family. For over a hundred years, one Belfast family has been at the heart of such revivals and have become known far and wide as singers, pipers, teachers and writers, with famous fans and famous pupils, 50 years of performance and 100 years of history. This is the story of the McPeak family. On a bucket of the The story begins with Francis McPeak I, often affectionately referred to as Me Dan. When my father wanted to learn an instrument, he went to the library and found out that there was two possible Irish instruments. One was a harp and the other was a, a tootle sack called Ellen, uh, the Ellen Pipes. So he was advised to go to the home of Francis Joseph Bigger. Bigger said, would your mother and father keep a mom if I was to ask him to teach you how to play the Ellen Pipes? And along came a man with what looked like a, a long box which would have housed the Ellen Pipes. And he had a label on his coat and he's, one of his hands, the right hand side and the left hand side were blue. Now the thing is, it said on, on the label on his coat, for the attention of Francis Joseph Bigger. He was blind and he had caught his fingers in the, uh, the carriage door of the train. So he come up and talking about train, he trained my father to play the Ellen Pipes. One day, during one of his lessons with John O'Reilly, the young Francis showed an extraordinary ability that even his teacher had never heard before. During one of the uh, let's say rehearsals round the hearth my father started to sing whilst he uh, was playing and John Riley who spoke very quickly appraised what are you doing what are you doing what are you doing and my father stopped singing and John Riley said don't 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 stop singing don't stop singing because it, it never had even heard of because in Ellen Pipes one's mouth is free so uh it was made use of by my father in singing, and John O'Reilly was enthralled by it. But the tradition of singing and playing carried on with his son, and to his grandson, who is now the last of the singing pipers. Charles, I 
celebrate my flowers will bring the summer back again. What will they bring me back the hours I spent with my brave Donald Jen? It's what it can feel gone the frown to where the fjord will be. But I follow you, my devil, too, for still I'm true to you, Mockery. Over the next few years, Francis met his wife, Mary, and soon started a family, having a daughter, also called Mary, in 1908, and a second child called Kitty, who was born in 1910. Kitty's son, Tommy McCrudden, tells us of his grandfather, Francis I. My, my dad, my grandfather, was a very likeable person. And my uncle Francie, you could have sat and you could have listened to my uncle Francie talking without. My uncle Francie was a great speaker. And my dad was the same. My dad was a, a nice man and a nice, nice speaker. But I remember one time that my dad and my uncle Francie were singing in the Royal Albert Hall. I don't know if you ever heard about that or not. Me and James was in the, in the audience, and uh, there was different. There was different. It was a concert, and it was all different people from the folk world that were singing at this concert. And my uncle Francie and my granddad went on to sing a couple of songs, to play a tune. And my uncle Francie says to my dad, while they were sitting down on the stage, "Da." Sing Nolan Fair. And my dad says, like, oh, everybody here listening to this. My dad says, like, it's a shitty old song, Nolan Fair. Sing it, because the people will enjoy it. And my dad sang Nolan Fair. And he got a big, big applause for that. Whenever James and me heard them going to sing Nolan Fair, we said, oh, not that. But and it was one of the best things that was done that night. It was more than fair when my dad done that. In 1912, Francis and John O'Reilly were reunited at the Oireachtas, a prestigious piping competition of the time. Well, within the Oireachtas, his teacher was John O'Reilly, a blind piper from uh, Dunmore, uh, County Galway. Now, my granda was in what then was classed the junior and John was in the senior. And he had my father had in the junior section, he was twenty seven and during his performance, as one may know in a competition everybody stays silent, but whilst my father was performing his piece or pieces, somebody stood up in the audience put their hands above their head and said, that's my paper, that's my paper. And it was John O'Reilly. He recognised the playing. Well, my father did win the junior section and I'll give you two guesses who won the senior section. John O'Reilly. So he'd been well taught because I, even though I never heard him till I was about 10 years of age when he was, oh, he was 65, 70. I knew he was a good piper. In 1926, tragedy struck Francis I with the untimely death of his daughter, Mary. My father uh, had three children, Mary, Kathleen, who we called Kitty, and Francis, my brother. But naturally, I, had, I was only a twinkle in my father's eye at that time, so... What happened, Mary, the oldest, who was very quiet uh, and reserved, sadly died at 16 or 18 in his arms. She had meningitis. 
but it, it was it was a sad time for Mada. Mada and his daughter Mary were very close. She was the eldest of the family. It was a sad time for Mada. I remember him talking about it. In 1930, Francis I's grandchild, Tommy McCrudden, was born. I was born in number five Springview Street. My uncle Francie was born in five Springview Street. My mother, Kitty McPeak, she was born in five Springview Street. My brother Frank was born in five Springview Street. And Ned was born in five Springview Street. I think everybody in Belfast was born in five Springview Street. It, it was, uh, and that's me and Frank went to school over in St Paul's. That was just in, in behind the, the police barracks on, on the Springfield Road there. And the morning that we went into school, we went in holding our hands and we were a wee bit holding back from going in. And the master changed, chased the two of us around the room. And everybody in, in the school, all the ones that was, were all laughing at me and him getting chased around the room. And we went back out again and over to the house again. And that was the first time I remember going, going to St Paul's school. But the same year also brought sad times for the family, which would eventually lead Francis I to almost completely retire as he suffered further loss with the death of his wife, Mary. And I remember in 1973, he told me about the death of his wife, Minnie, and the tears in his eyes. He just remembered about it, so he must, must have loved her. Uh, I was born in 19... April in 1930, and she died, I think, July or August or that same year. And I was the only grandson that she ever seen. He knew his first wife Mary was dying, so he called the family and he, he says to my daddy, uh, you, you might kiss your mother, uh, it'll probably be the last time you'll do that. And shortly after that, uh, she died. 1936 brought new life and love for Francis Sr. as he married his second wife Alice and soon they had their first child together, future harpist James McPeak. He was a widow for a long time and he met my mother and she had been a widow for a long time in the met and uh, I was born. Around this time Francis II was continuing to take an interest in playing the pipes and Francis Sr.'s new marriage would give him the beginnings of an idea for a song that would still be associated with the mid-peaks today. Will you go, lassie, go? So it, be, it finished up being an international hit, and everybody in the world has claimed that their grannies and grannies wrote it, but we know, and I know, that my father wrote it. Because in the last verse, not necessarily as it isn't proof, but the last person, if my true love she were gone, I would surely find another. So he actually married my mother. This song would soon travel far and wide and eventually become the signature song of the McPeaks and an anthem for folk music the world over. Eventually being recorded by artists including Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, Pete Seeger and Joan Baez, amongst many others.
but the family's life was soon again disrupted with the coming of the Second World War. On Easter Tuesday night, the, the, the air raid, the, the Germans came over on Easter Tuesday night and they were bombing the place. And we were all in the house and were told, the air raid wardens were in the streets and telling people to stay indoors. So there were whistling bombs all over the place. I remember standing in between my father's legs and looking at the sky and it was red and I could hear and I could hear the whole mm, which is aircraft. Well in, during the, the time that we were all in the house there was a massive explosion a couple of hours later and the whole fire was blew from one side of the house till the other side of the house and some of the people that was in the house there was other people in the house for by, by, for by, for by our family and some of the, there was holy water th through all over the place and the people thought that it was blood and they were feeling their heads and they were everything was in darkness and they were feeling it and they were, they were thinking it was blood and it came out that it was just a holy water. Somebody was sprinkling holy water. Just after that, the, the area wardens told everybody to get out of their houses. This is while the blitz was going on. And we moved over, which when you think of it was a bit silly. We moved over to the beach where the beach mound bungalows were built. But before they were built, we lay on mounds and I lay inside my father's coat and my mother lay there as well. And we wouldn't have been any more than a half a mile from Mackey's foundry, which would have been one of the targets for Hitler's bombers. So we were a bit other people, you know, went up the mountains to get well, well, well away. That explosion that was, it was a landmine that landed at the bottom of Home Dean Gardens in a, a family's garden called Galt. Galt's lived in it at the time. We were walking up, me and my mother and the rest of our family were walking up Home Dean Gardens, going towards the Forum Cinema. When we turned around and we seen the, where the landmine land man had landed, it wrecked the, most of Etna Drive, part of Home Dean Gardens, part of Strathroy Park. In the meantime, we moved, we moved on up towards the Forum Cinema and the, the Forum Cinema was, it was crammed. Everybody was in it from our down and surrounding areas. In the meantime, one of the, the, the people came in with figurines all up their coat and people were being killed outside. Although war still raged across Europe, life through the McPeaks carried on. Francis McPeak III was born on the 30th of April 1942. We were evacuated, but the thing is that I was born where we were evacuated to, but that's where he brought uh, the pipes down. It didn't matter about furniture, delf, beds or anything. Uh, he come to Belfast and got the pipes. One night he put them out in the early shelter, brought them back in the next day, and then he eventually brought them down to Minerstown uh, in County Down, and that's where they really started to, to put the pipes all back together and play, and my granda, my granda teaching my daddy extra things on how to, really how to play the pipes and uh, they done that for let me see I think three or four years now there was no television uh, or anything uh, connected that way there was a radio yes but there was no traditional music or anything only my granda and he taught my daddy quite a lot. 
they fixed the pipes up. Then they got two chanters and then they started to play. But it all stemmed from uh, the 40s on up and in, in through till the present day. And my daddy playing encouraged my granda to restart again. And when he got him, you know what I mean, got him into good form, my granda started to enjoy playing again. Although Francis I continued to teach his son, he had been retired now for close to 20 years. But in 1949, Francis Jr. convinced him to get a second set of pipes. And by 1950, history was in the making as the two began to perform as a duo. My daddy used to play quite often on, on the BBC, uh, on the radio. But hearing my daddy playing was, was one thing. You heard him and you didn't know whether you wanted to play the instrument or didn't want to play the instrument. So my mummy come to the door and shout it for us. Your daddy's on the radio, you, you know. And he started to play. And I thought it was absolutely beautiful. Really, really beautiful. And from then, that's whenever I took up wanting to play the pipes. I wanted to play the pipes like my daddy. And it was only later I found out the difference in the styles of, of, of my granda. And my style is a, a mix of the both of them, but it's still MacPeak style of piping. Yeah, you have uh, Paddy Keenan, Finbar Fury, you had the Rousums, you had lots of different pipers. We all have our own style. We know what we're doing, but my style that I have today is a more, to me, is more of a northern style and in playing. But with my daddy, he played for years on, on, the, on the BBC. Well, thank God for it, because that's what where I fell in love with, uh, with wanting to really play the pipes. I, it was a lovely summer's day and the, coming out of the radio, it sounded beautiful. James McPeak tells the story of how, in 1954, the duo became a trio as he joined the family on their travels. But since my father in uh, Belgium at the Pan County Congress had had the opportunity to be accompanied by a Welsh harper called Page, and my father thought that it would be nice when he came back home if he played the Indian pipes. He would love to be accompanied by a harper, but apparently harpers were too important. So he had to dig his own partner, his own harpist, which was me. So I became the third member of the McPeak family trio. But to be honest, it was my brother that resurrected the McPeak family, not my father, because if my father had been left to my father, all he wanted to do was survive and feed his family, which was just me. And mind you, you know by the size of me, I must have ate a lot. The trio travelled far and wide, and their success even brought them behind the Iron Curtain. And my father said to me, there's a fella who's in here and he wants us to play in Glasgow, and this would probably have been about April, and he wants us to play in July, not this July, the following July. And I said, that's about a year and a quarter ahead, but I'd, I'd love to go to Glasgow because I never was in Glasgow. And Dad says, well, his name's Bobby Heatley, and he'll be up next Wednesday. So my brother Francie made sure he was there and I was there. So Bobby Heatley came in and talked about uh, the possibilities, you know, of performing. And he, he said, would it be all right uh, for you to make the journey? Because it's a brave distance away. And we said, oh, that should be all right. And I, I, 
I was, I was, I was looking forward to going to Scotland, Glasgow. He says, it's not Glasgow, it's Moscow. Which, my, my father's hard of hearing, he thought he said Glasgow. So anyway, we eventually did go to Moscow in 1957, but my father didn't make it. Just my brother, myself, and my wife combined it with a honeymoon. So we went there in 1957 on a honeymoon, and I, I had to pay £38. My wife had, or I had to pay £38 for her as well, and my brother got for nothing because he was uh, the one that was the boss of the music. And I said, Francie, we well, were told we could make a movie over there, or get part of a movie, and, and get some money. I said, if we get money, I take my £38 back. So we went there, sat, sat at a film studio for two days, and nobody really wanted us to choir. But later on, we got a job in Radio Moscow, and we got £70 for it, and I got my £38. So we went for three weeks to Moscow and one week to Leningrad, and we had a most wonderful time. I saw caviar piled a foot high in the Raiders Club in the Kremlin and didn't even know what it was. But again, Russia and Moscow is another story. In 1959, the trio released their first album, The McPeak Family of Belfast for Prestige International, a recording which is still prized by collectors today. A birdie sang on the Navy Bunch and the song he sang with the Joga Punch. Ewan McCall, a very famous folk singer and writer of songs, and his then wife or partner, Peggy Seeger, uh, that got an American company interested in recording the McPeak Trio, and we made a record in London. From as early as 1956, young Francis III had begun to play pipes and after being taught by his father and grandfather, he soon joined them on stage. The trio was playing for quite a while, but because I was a, a piper, we got a, an extra chanter, and for a while, four of us uh, just played three pipes and James on the harp. Now that's before Kathleen and Tommy uh, come and tell it. Early on we didn't have the instruments to go round everybody, but we did acquire them later on. In 1962, Kathleen and Tommy McCrudden also joined the group, now known as the McPeak family, where they met Pete Seeger during his world tour. Pete Seeger came over here with his lovely wife Toshi, a Japanese lady, and their family, and he was travelling around Ireland and he was and he came to take some movies of the McPeak family. But the camera he had was a 16 millimeter camera and most probably the lenses aren't the end that they are today. So we had to take our front window out in number five Spring Street so that he could get the distance. His camera was out in the street and we performed in the house. In 1963, they recorded a new album, with another to follow in 64, and yet another in 65. With three full albums in three years, the next step was America. When my father and us toured the States with Pete Seeger in 1965, Pete Seeger took my father to a hospital in New York, where Woody Guthrie was to meet Woody Guthrie, uh, and he was, well, he was probably on his deathbed, you know, but. First time I landed in America, 1965, we were, we were, we were treated like VIP people, even from, from what were in Dublin and from what were leaving Dublin. There was newspaper people and, and 
all over the place. So when we went, we went to London, America. That was to the invitation of Pete Seeger. We lived actually in a house in 4th Street, just off 5th Avenue, owned by a chap called Ralph Rinsler, who was actually the manager of Duck Watson. And we all, it was February, I think, at that time, and what I found it, you two. So, but he had radiators on upstairs, nice and warm. And at night, and on night time when we weren't playing, he would have taken us into his wee office, turned the record player on, lit a candle, and played ghost stories to us. I thought that was, that was a bit of fun. We were, we were staying in Granny's Village, I did with Ron, Ralph Ronsler. Francie and my uncle Francie went into a sweet we and like I think it was a wee bar or like a type of restaurant and uh, I was standing behind them, you know, we would sing it. We weren't we were just there for the the Halloween just a, wee, a couple of songs. Not nothing in particular. And Bob Dylan and Two other people along with them come in, you know. With with the sound that we were making, he, Bob Dylan thought he never heard the like of it, you know. And he just mentioned that, and he he would say, he says, like, "What's your name of your wee group?" And my uncle Francis says, "It's well, it's a group, but it's a, it's a family group." And then like Bob Dylan was, "You're all related, like?" I said, "Oh, there's only th- three or four of us here." There's, there's a couple of us still, but he was, he never forgot the name of McPixley. I remember meeting Bob Davenport, or not Bob Davenport, Bob Dillon. But I didn't, I only saw him from the back, he's, he's curly hair. But my brother knew Bob Dillon more than any of the rest of us. I think he'd met him in London beforehand. So, uh, as a young fellow, I was there, I did Bob Dillon. He was a millionaire there, but just a one millionaire. As mainstream music came to be dominated by the folk world, the music of the McPeaks reached a whole new audience. In 1967, they released a fourth family album, but it was a 1968 appearance on the popular Dave Allen show that brought them their most famous fans of all. So what happened was that um, Taylor uh, arranged everything when we went to uh, the airport, Charles lifted us, put us on the plane. When we got to London, there was a limousine at, at the plane. We come down, and everybody's looking to see who's getting into this limousine off the plane. Till at anyway, they brought us to I think it's the Dorchester, and they they put us down in the car park and slipped us up in the elevators, up into the rooms. And then whenever the party was in full swing, uh, Cella Blacks, Lulu, dozens of people, the Straubs, all, all musicians. And we were on a carousel, a carousel uh, stage and we started to play and then the carousel just turned round and we were we were playing and the place went hush and that's when I first met uh, John Lennon and uh, the rest of the, the, the Beatles. And the Beatles said we'll have them to perform. Now they went there, John, from what I know, my nephew would know more about it than me, but what I, I do know, uh, John Lennon was enthralled by Ellen Pipes, and McCartney was interested too, but the other two had no interest at all. Uh, we made arrangements to go and see uh, John Lennon in number three, Carnaby Street. That was my daddy, Kathleen, and myself. And we carried the pipes in anyway, and. John was there and we greeted each other. A photographer come in and took different photos. But a strange thing, whenever he put the pipes on, 
he made an awful good good attempt at somebody uh, putting pipes on for the first time and he was very knowledgeable about pipes and d different things and when we put them on well he made the same mistake he thought they were possibly like the war pipes uh, when I say that that you just put them onto your arm and uh, when you fill the bag you forget about the bellows but he started to uh, like a like a duck waddling you know what I mean and moving and he got he got a sound out of them but he played them and he smiled and he laughed and I looked over and Yoko was sitting at a long there was a long uh, settee I think there was was a black one anyway and she was sitting up at the far end of it she didn't say nothing and just sat there watching everything but John was rather uh, I think enthralled enthralled with the sound of the pipes and whenever he uh, played them for a piece he was very but he wanted to keep going and keep going and I told him, stop a minute, and my daddy explained uh, just exactly what to do. And he blew them up again and sat and he played them. And then we put the drones on and he blew away at the drones. And he was enthralled with the sound. You see, that was what John had heard was uh, when we played pipes. We actually played flat pipes, which are in C. They're not in the concert pitch. So he loved the sound because it was a, a more natural, a more natural pitch for someone to be able to sing to, and that's why he actually called it fairy music, the fairy music of Ireland. Although the McPeaks had reached a popularity that would see them in continued demand, in three short years it would come to an abrupt end. In 1971, Francis I passed away on St. Patrick's Day, and with his death came an end to the touring and performing of the McPeak family. Actually what happened was my father had to go to the hospital because he wasn't well, but he lay in the hospital and we visited him. All every day. On the day he died, there was nobody at his bedside. And the time he died. Not the day he died, the time he died. So in actual fact, his last breath, breath was sad to say he was spent alone. We all believed. You see, my nephews, nieces, all called my father my da, as well as myself and my brother and my sister called him a dad but all their siblings always called him a dad yeah and he was our dad and he was never gonna die 1977 brought a new dimension to the story of the mcpeaks as again a father and son team breathed new life into the traditional music scene when Francis II and III opened the doors of their music school. From these humble beginnings came a music school that would change Belfast's traditional music scene forever. The shows that they've done, they've played from the Ulster Hall, everywhere. They went to Lorient, they have went to uh, the Folk Awards, uh, they played for, for the World Boxing, the, they played for the world dancing. They played everywhere. And I have to give it to the children. They're brilliant musicians. But we have won up to 30, 30 competitions, uh, places in one day. You know what I mean? Like uh, duets, trios, singles. Uh, some, of our, some of our people were in competitions that you had to go till in another, say to the Ulsters, and sometimes we had, we had twenty, sometimes with forty people, 
uh, going through competitions in one day. So if you take that, if you take that from May uh, up to the end of August, we have won fifty and sixty. We had that medals. You would need a wheelbarrow to carry them home, and and cups and all that sort of thing. But competitions is only good for for pupils to be able to practice. After winning competition after competition, the fame of the school began to spread as they played bigger events, including the Ulster Hall in 1985. A whole lot of them all, like Paddy, like Sir Paddy Keenan and all, he came up to do the, the anniversary concert for my dad in 1985. Um, 4th and 5th of May, 85. he done the two concerts along with the McPicks themselves. Pinch of Snuff, Barnbrack, who James was involved with then. Tommy was playing with the Pinch of Snuff, and they then joined with the rest of the family to come back with the galleries and make pigs for that night. Um, ourselves, Children of Plummer done it, Paddy Keenan, there was loads, Tommy Sands, loads of them done the shows, two shows for the on this birthday if he had been alive of my dad. In 1986, the family suffered another blow, this time with the passing of Francis McPeak II on the 7th of July. I phoned home to my daughter to see that everything was all right at home. And she said, he said, yes, she said, yes, everything's all right. And I said, you want to speak to her mommy? Yeah. So I spoke to her mommy. And we went in the car, went back to the hotel, and I decided, rather than come back to uh, our wonderful Belfast on the twelfth or eleventh of July, I'd rather stay out of it because it wasn't the place for me during those dates. I said, "Well, cut across Wales, and we'll go over from Hollyhead to Dublin, and maybe stay to uh, uh, a day or two in Dublin." So we got up the next morning to head for Clongathlin and Wales. And when I got into the car, my wife said to me, by the way, Francie's not very well. I said, how do you know? She said, and then the next breath she said, ah, he's not expected to live. Oh, and the next thing she said, he was buried yesterday. <laughs> Just memories coming back, I can't help it, and I'm not ashamed of it. But nevertheless, we, uh, Went and drove through Clan Gotham and there was more tears there. Got on the boat, bought the Irish press, and there was a photograph of his coffin coming out of the church. And I said, Oh, I'm not going to Dublin. And so I got off the boat and drove straight home. And down to Theodore Street. And I was so glad. I shouldn't have said that I was not in Belfast during his passing. I was in Clare whenever my father died and the man who owned the place was Pat Blake and he got us in touch with a stonemason and his name was McTeak and I brought him down stuff f to let him see what my daddy was like and the instruments and whatnot and he done some wonderful work he put him in the middle of, of the Celtic cross, sitting, you can see his hands 
plan, plan, plan the pipes. And on the back of it, he made a carving of him sitting playing the pipes. Rather than everybody puts photos in, but photos will eventually disappear, but the carving will be there as long as the headstone stands. Eugene McPeak is the son of Francis III and now carries on the family traditions of teaching and performing. Today the McPeaks are once again performing. This time the group consisting of Tommy McCrudden, Francie, Eugene and James McPeak. We caught up with them today in the Ulster Hall as they prepare for their 50th anniversary celebration. Oh. 